Thanks, Chiming. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to present on uh, deciphering the mystery of agitated ceiling contrast. It's actually a rounds I presented back in 2016 and um, still very relevant today. I've updated it with a few additional uh, cases and some additional thoughts. You know, I think um, the Semites economic and we're known for um, our, our, our expertise in, in ultrasound enhancing agents or contrast, um, but perhaps less known, less well known is our expertise in, in the use of agitated ceiling contrast for various indications. And I think part of that is because we have um, world expertise in this condition called hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia or HHT where patients develop pulmonary AV malformations and we see these patients on a regular basis and they get actually ceiling contrast as part of their workup. Um, and so certainly uh, we, we probably do, I expect we do more actually ceiling contrast than, than probably any other lab across, uh, across Canada. So today here are the objectives. Uh, we're gonna discuss some of the basic principles behind these studies, review features of intracardiac uh, uh, shunting, uh, PFOs plus or minus other interatrial shunts versus Transpulmonary shunting or HHT, uh, some of the nuances uh, behind this, and uh, it's not quite as uh, quite as simple as as you may think. And we certainly have seen many challenging cases over the years. And we'll review some of these uh, challenging cases, and hopefully, um, I can get a little bit of audience input if uh, people are brave enough to to step up and uh, and lend an opinion on some of these uh, these interesting cases. Okay, so first question is how does how does agitated ceiling contrast work, and what are some of the basic principles? Well, when you think about microbubbles or bubbles in general, we the first thing you want to think about is the size of these these bubbles. So a microbubble, by definition, is less than 100 microns in diameter, and as a reference point, a reference point, red cells, which uh, obviously flow freely through the blood circulation, are anywhere from six to eight microns, and when we do agitated ceiling contrast. Um, in general, they tend to be a little bit larger, about 16, 16 plus microns in diameter. There's a wide range, as you can imagine. Um, and, and, and at the bottom, you can see that the actual ceiling contrast is really um, um, created by um, the uh, rapid injection of, 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 of fluid, usually saline, it can be other fluids, and a small amount of ear, usually anywhere from um, uh, anywhere from uh, 0.05 up to probably about 0.103, 0.105 milliliters. Um, so just a small amount of air, you don't want to use too much air, um, and you rapidly inject them between two syringes to create the acid ceiling contrast, and then you inject it rapidly before the, the bubbles dissipate. And the, the, the ultrasound enhancing agents that we use day to day for left ventricle pacification the first generation Albinex uh, microbubbles were three to five microns, uh, and the, the newer agents, Definity, Sonaview, for example, um, or Lumison, um, uh, are two, uh, are in, uh, on average 2.5 microns. Um, and just as, a, as I mentioned, actually, ceiling contrast really is a wide range of microbubbles, and within those, um, there probably are a few or a small select subpopulation that are smaller than red cells and may, um, may cross the pulmonary circulation and end up in the left heart, uh, even in the absence of either an interatrial or a transpulmonary shunt. Um, it doesn't happen very often because uh, actually ceiling contrast really doesn't last very long in the circulation compared to ultrasound enhancing agents, which actually have a, a defined uh, shell uh, that uh, allow them to persist long in the circulation. So usually, even if you have these small uh, microbubbles that, that um, physically may cross the pulmonary circulation in the absence of an AVM, uh, they generally do not persist long enough to, to do that. But every now and then we'll see what I, what I would refer to as a stray bubble end up on the left side of the heart. Uh, that's a variant of normal and not indicative of a, a true AV malformation or an interatrial shunt. So after peripheral intravenous injection of actually ceiling contrast, uh, in normal patients, no shunting, either uh, interatrial or 
uh, intracardiac or uh, transpulmonary, no microbubbles should be evident in the left heart structures. As I said, any, any bubble, any structure uh, greater than 9 to 10 microns cannot pass through pulmonary capillaries. They're just too large, they'll plug um, and um, they'll dissipate um, and they won't be present in the left heart. Um, uh, as bubbles uh, fracture and get smaller, internal pressure increases, they lose their gas rapidly and they dissolve, as I said. And the transit time uh, across the pulmonary circuit is generally longer, as you can imagine, versus intracardiac, estimated to be about 1.6 seconds or more. So here's an actually a saline contrast, or what we call a bubble study. And um, what you want to see is you want to see good, homogeneous, and fairly bright opacification of the right heart structures. And you want to follow uh, any appearance of bubbles in the left heart. To, uh, and you want to follow long enough um, to detect even leaf bubbles, and ideally long enough that the opacification in the right heart is, is already dissipated uh, and almost disappeared. And this is a this is a negative agitating, uh, agitated ceiling contrast study. Um, sometimes we'll be fooled by bright cords. You can see a, a cord that's flipping uh, back and forth. Um, and sometimes we'll have to slow the, 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 the study down and, and actually try and track the, the, the bubble, bubbles as they cross from the left atrium into the left ventricle. If you only see structures in the left ventricle and you don't see anything in the left atrium, then just be concerned that you're picking up um, little bright cords or, 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 or bright, bright flex on cords, uh, and they don't really represent a positive ceiling contrast. Ideally, if it's positive with an intiatrial shunt or transpulmonary shunt, it should be going uh, in the left atrium and left ventricle uh, after a right heart pacification. So, how do we tell whether or not it's more likely to be an intracardiac shunt versus a transpulmonary shunt? Well, there's a three-beat rule, uh, and I would say this is a, a general rule or a guide. It's not. It's not definitive. Um, so if contrast or the the, the ashy saline uh, uh, bubbles appear in the left side, particularly the left atrium going into the left ventricle, within three cardiac cycles of full right atrial pacification, then we would say an intracardiac shunt is present. And if it's after three cardiac cycles, um, then a pulmonary AV fistula or AV malformation uh, is implied. Um, I, I think this is a reasonable rule. Uh, I think uh, it's only uh, less than three cardiac cycles more likely to be uh, a trans, uh, sorry, intracardiac or uh, interatrial. Um, I think greater than five, I think more likely to be uh, transpulmonary. Within three to five, um, um, uh, it's a bit of a gray zone um, uh, and lots of caveats and we'll discuss some of those. Yeah, so here's an actually ceiling contrast, and this is an early um, positive study. And let's see that play that again here. So probably within two cardiac cycles, and reassuringly, you see, you see what I would call a puff of contrast, a puff of bubbles uh, from uh, appearing in the left atrium. Um, you know, it, it almost appears to be coming from the antheatral septum. I think it's a bit challenging to localized, sometimes think localization of shunting with atrocin contrast is much better performed on T. And with transthoracic, sometimes we can be fooled whether or not we think something is coming through a pulmonary vein. And if we have good imaging pictures, then we can be a little bit more sure. So this is a, an early um, atrocin concealing contrast study within one to two cardiac cycles. Uh, and uh, in a what I would say is a more intermittent fashion and much more likely to be um, uh, uh, an intatrial shunt, uh, shunt uh, and the PFO is the more likely one versus SNASD. The right heart does not look does not look dilated. Um, so here's another uh, uh, in contrast study, and so here in contrast um, uh, uh, to the first study, first of all, this is a more continuous um, opacification of the left heart. Uh, it's greater. Um, it appears a little bit later. Um, and you get the sense that the, the bubbles are coming in from the pulmonary veins on the superior aspect of the left atrium. So one, two, three. And this one is fairly early. This is probably three to four cardiac cycles. Um, and if you use the three-beat rule, you might think that this is a, a PFO. But the other clue here is uh, a couple of clues. One is the more continuous fashion 
um, of the opacification of the left heart, uh, almost to the same extent as the right heart. And later on, at the very end, you can see the opacification in the left heart is almost a little bit greater than the right heart. And that's also another clue uh, for uh, pulmonary AV malformations or trans pulmonary shunting. Um, yeah, so this, this uh, and here you can get the sense that this coming from the superior aspect of the left atrium and not necessarily from um, the uh, intraatrial septum. Once again, uh, localization, I think, is, uh, is, is pretty challenging. Uh, but this is a case of, uh, of, of uh, HHT uh, uh, pulmonary AV malformations. I didn't talk about the grading. Uh, we do grade the shunt based on the opacification of the left heart, and uh, most of, uh, of you who've been through the lab know that the grading is anywhere from one plus to four plus. So one plus is, is, is a few bubbles. And if, uh, as a general rule, if you, if you think you can stop the frames and count the number of bubbles, then it's probably one plus or less than one plus if there's only a few bubbles. Uh, if it's if it's uh, um, a mild opacification, but probably kind of too much to count, then it's two plus. Um, a four plus is essentially the same opacification uh, as um, the right heart. And three plus is good opacification, but not as bright as uh, as the right atrium right ventricle. So for me, this will be a solid, solid three plus. So I might say three to four plus. But this is a significant shift. So some tips to to enhance the actually ceiling contrast study. So well, first of all, I think use of second harmonic imaging, including during transesophageal echo, is important. Uh, you, you use second harmonic imaging to uh, accentuate um, the signal from uh, ultra enhancing agents like Definity and and Lumison. Um, uh, but um, uh, but um, uh, the the principles still hold for actually ceiling contrast. So use second harmonic imaging. Studies have shown that you get better pacification with use of blood saline or colloid um, uh, um, uh, as opposed to just uh, regular saline. So sometimes it will draw back a little bit of blood into the syringe and switch that around with the air. So it's, uh, it's blood saline, a bit of air mixture, and that tends to have a brighter pacification of the right heart structures. Studies have shown that multiple injections um, uh, are more likely to pick up uh, shunting, whether it's intraatrial shunting or, or, or AV malformation, uh, transpulmonary shunting. Uh, and, and the studies, particularly for detection of PFO, suggest that sometimes you have to use up to 10 uh, actually ceiling contrast injections in order to really detect the PFO um, because of some of the principles I'll, I'll talk about in the next uh, few slides. Um, also, studies have shown that if you use a femoral or a leg intravenous injection, uh, you're more likely to enhance uh, PFO detection. And the reasons for this is is because um, uh, 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 acetylene or blood coming from the from the lower extremity gets directed actually directly towards the atrial septum uh, by the eustachian valve, and this is uh, a remnant of of embryology uh, for blood coming from the placenta uh, uh, to uh, cross directly through the the, the patent foramen valley, which, as you know, is is open um, during fetal life. Uh, to uh, allow uh, uh, oxygenated blood to get to the fetus um, in the left side. Um, and because of that, um, eustachian valve that directs blood directly towards the atrial septum, um, it, it's been shown to, to have a greater effect for PFO detection. Uh, and then, of course, the Valsalva maneuver, which we'll talk about. So this this chap, this, this is, uh, you know, in any rounds of St. Michael's, you know, you have to include or you, you, you were tempted to include some historical apps, uh, aspects, and this is because of Dr. Chow, of course. He's a, a big proponent of the history of uh, cardiology. Um, he talks about this a lot, so I'm going to have to include a, one reference to some of the historical uh, aspects uh, as an homage to, to Qi Ming. Uh, and this, this gentleman is, of course, Valsalva. Um, and uh, his uh, full name is Antonio Maria Valsalva. I want to put on my Italian accent. Um, so he was uh, circa 19, sorry, 1666 to 1723. He was an Italian uh, anatomist. He was born in Imola, Italy. I have no idea where Imola is. Um, he received his doctorates in medicine and philosophy in Bologna in uh, 1687, appointed professor of anatomy at the University of Bologna, later appointed a president of the Academy of Sciences. So, of course, a very distinguished uh, scientist. Um, and he, his most substantial contribution to the field of medicine was his 
uh, detailed illustrated work of the anatomy, physiology, and pathology of the ear, interestingly enough, nothing to do with the heart, published in 1704. And his name is all over um, uh, uh, medical literature. It's the Vasalva maneuver, as we know, as a forced expiratory effort uh, against a closed glottis or closed earway. Um, it's, we, we know it from the sinuses of Vasalva, as we know, it's a the out pouches of the aorta, the pulmonary artery opposite the flaps of the semilunar valves. There's a valsalva antrum, a cavity in the temporal bone communicating with the uh, 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 epitympanic recess of the middle ear. Valsalva ligaments, uh, also ear associated, um, that help attach the oracle to the side of the head. Valsalva muscle, um, also associated with the ear. This is a muscle uh, in the ear occurring as a band on the outer surface of the tragus of the oracle. And then the tinea of Valsalva, uh, which is in the large intestine, um, these are longitudinal muscle fibers. So lots of references to Valsalva. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the Valsalva has a couple of different phases uh, 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 to it from a physiologic standpoint. Uh, and there are four different phases. Um, I think this was uh, at one point a Royal College cardiology question. I'm not sure if they still have this. Um, uh, so, and this goes back to basic uh, sort of physiology. Um, uh, phase one and phase two are the strain phases, onset of strain, and then continuous strain for five to 20 seconds. And then the release uh, phase is phase three, when you release that Valsalva, and phase four is recovery. Um, and then uh, on the right side of this, um, uh, this table, you can see the effects on systolic blood pressure and pulse. During the strain phase, Onset is um, 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 uh, characterized by an increase in blood pressure and a decrease in the pulse. And we'll see this actually during the strain phase of Alsava on echocardiography when you see that, that little bit of bradycardia that occurs uh, or reduction in the pulse during that strain phase when the patient's straining. Uh, and then when they release it uh, or late during the strain phase and then upon release, you get that increase in the pulse, this little reflex uh, tachycardia. Uh, blood pressure we know decreases um, uh, during the, uh, the the strain phase into recovery uh, due to uh, decreased venous return and then increased venous return in recovery. So here's a, here's the blood pressure and heart rate effects uh, during the Valsalva maneuver in graphical form. You can see the increase in blood pressure during the strain phase, reduction in the heart rate, and then uh, late in the uh, rec in the strain phase and into recovery, you get that little bit of a reflex attack cardiac here, um, uh, and then a rebound in the blood pressure. We use a Vasalva maneuver during, uh, during physical exam. Of course, we know the, that during the strain phase of the Valsalva, uh, venous return decreases, cardiac output decreases, ventricular volume decreases. And during this time, murmurs of mitral valve prolapse and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with SAM, systolic anti motion of the mitral valve leaflets will increase, whereas most other murmurs will decrease because of the decreased cardiac output, such as aortic stenosis, mit uh, mitral regurgitation, et cetera. And then the release phase, um, when venous return is increased, cardiac output is increased, the ventricular volumes increases, the murmur of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and mitral valve prolapse uh, decreases, and the murmurs of, of many other um, valvular lesions uh, will increase. Um, so we, we tend to use, um, uh, during a physical exam, the strain phase uh, to enhance murmurs of mitral valve prolapse, mitral regurgitation, and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with left ventricular also tract obstruction. With um, Valsalva in uh, actual ceiling contrast, uh, we actually use it during the release phase when venous return increases, right atrial pressure increases, uh, and we try to uh, enhance uh, shunting from the right atrium into the left atrium. Uh, this is used of Valsalva during echo for uh, LV alpha tract obstruction. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is also is, is, is not during the release phase. This is during the strain phase of the Valsalva when the patient's bearing down. Peak gradient across the LVOT, 23 millimeters of mercury going up to 57 millimeters of mercury um, with the Valsalva maneuver, a nice dagger shape. And we saw some nice images from Patrick at um, uh, last week's rounds on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Valsalva maneuver used to be used uh, uh, for a diastology. 
Uh, so when we we saw normal EA ratios in the mitral inflow pattern, we would do the Valsalva maneuver. And once again, this is actually doing the strain phase where venous return decreases, left atrial filling decreases, and then you convert uh, a normal pattern of EA um, ratio to uh, an impaired relaxation pattern with EA reversal. Um, and uh, this hints that um, this is a pseudonormal or grade two diastolic dysfunction. Now, of course, with tissue Doppler um, uh, uh, being uh, uh, introduced uh, many years ago and its utility in uh, assessment of diastolic function, the um, uh, septal and lateral uh, E-prime velocities, uh, the Vasava maneuver to um, bring out impaired relaxation pattern for pseudonormal is, is really no longer uh, needed on a regular basis. So it's nice to do it on occasion because it's, uh, it's a kind of a neat maneuver. So here's a patient doing the valsalva. You can see the, the bradycardia doing the strain phase and then release. Usually we ask the sonographers to, to tell the patient to release as soon as you see bubbles in the right atrium. And then you get that rush of actually sitting uh, in the right atrium right ventricle because of that increased venous return. And during that time, right atrial pressure increases uh, and exceeds left atrial pressure usually and then there's that impetus to um, uh, to uh, get shunting from the right atrium into the left atrium uh, during that uh, release phase of the Valsalva. Uh, and uh, comforting, you, you want to see good opacification of the atrial septum. Ideally, you want to see a bit of that bulge of the right atrium into the left atrium, knowing that right atrial pressure has indeed exceeded left atrial pressure uh, and that you've done a good Valsalva uh, maneuver a release um, uh, to um, uh, uh, detect uh, uh, into atrial shunt. Bradycardia, release, bit of tachycardia, and okay, perfect. Okay, so here's another bubble study. Straining, release, enhanced venous return, and you get that early positive uh, ceiling contrast study. You actually see a little bit of black space here, and this is this is um, a negative contrast effect. Um, this is um, potentially one of the signs used to detect a left to right, la, uh, left to right shunt, uh, but this is 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 more likely to be a negative uh, uh, contrast effect because of uh, a, 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 a non uh, 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 bubble containing blood from the IVC um, that is coming in uh, the right atrium. Uh, and uh, not allowing opacification of that area uh, of the right atrium. But here you can see with, uh, with the release uh, of the Valsalva, you can see a bit of a bulge uh, of the atrial septum and then bubbles crossing over. Uh, and ideally, you want to time um, the release phase as soon as the bubbles enter the right atrium. If you time it later on, then you might still get a positive saline contrast study, but it may not be within that first uh, three beats of the cardiac cycle. Uh, something to be to be mindful of. Okay, so things to know about uh, uh, PFO detection with actually saline. So usually, as we know from physiology, left atrial pressure exceeds the right atrial pressure in the normal heart, but there is a small degree of periodic right to left shunting that occur, can occur at rest even in the normal heart, can occur two times during the cardiac cycle where RA pressure transly exceeds left atrial pressure. One is during isovolumic ventricular contraction, and the second time is during early ventricular diastole. As I mentioned, during the release phase of an effective Valsalva effort, the septum, we should look to see a transiently deviated uh, leftward, pointing towards the lower pressure chamber. Um, but we can get an ineffective um, Valsalva for a number of, of reasons. Um, you might be, uh, the patient may not be unable to adequately increase their abdominal pressure because of a medical illness, recent operation, uh, including intra-abdominal operations, use of sedation with, with tea when they can't follow instructions. Well, in some patients, just they just, um, they just, they just don't get it. Uh, and they just not, they, you, you have to use a couple of tricks. Sometimes you can say, um, you pretend you're blowing into a balloon, for example. Um, uh, one trick is that you can get them to blow into a, into a closed syringe. Um, to try and simulate that Valsalva maneuver. Um, if you have a high left atrial pressure for whatever reason, um, it could be severe mitral regurgitation, it could be 
uh, high filling pressure on the left side because of heart failure, whether it's HEFPEF or HEFREF, it might prevent uh, uh, properly uh, performing the valsalva effort or cough enough to increase that right atrial pressure to uh, exceed left atrial pressure. And you may have a negative uh, saline contrast uh, study um, because you can't get an RF pressure high enough. Uh, so if you don't see uh, LA contrast appear during, during an HCA saline contrast study, uh, but the uh, atrial septum is persistently uh, rightward deviated uh, at all times, then, then you have to be suspicious that a PFO has not been uh, effectively excluded. Some false positives for a PFO, so a, a saline contrast study that is positive uh, in the absence of a PFO. Well, of course, if you have another type of anti-atrial shunt, such as a sinus venosis defect, uh, for example, that could yield an as a positive saline contrast uh, when it's not related to PFO, it's related to a, a sinus venosis uh, defect, or it could be a secundum, more, less likely to miss a primum uh, atrial septal defect. There's this phenomenon called pseudocontrast that's caused by the Valsalva effect. Uh, and in theory, uh, a really profound Valsalva effect can lead to spontaneous contrast that builds in the pulmonary veins due to stagnation of blood um, in the pulmonary veins that gets released upon a release of the Valsalva maneuver. I, I, I seem to recall we may have had one, maybe two cases where we've seen this during T during a Valsava, and that maybe I can ask the attendings at the end of the rounds whether or not they remember seeing any any cases where they they were convinced that there was a pseudo contrast effect by the Valsava maneuver that resulted in a positive season contrast study. And then lastly, um, is mistaking a large persistent uh, eustachian valve for the atrial septum, and you see some bubbles on the other side. Uh, of this uh, structure, and you think it's in the left atrial side, but it's actually um, it's actually uh, a eustachian valve. So false negatives uh, for PFO detection with acetylcholine contrast. Well, first of all, is if you don't use that valsalva or cough to translate increase the R pressure, you just do it uh, at rest. You may miss PFOs. Inability of the patient, as I mentioned, to perform an adequate valsalva to increase R pressure. Uh, inability to translate increase RA pressure beyond LA pressure despite good effort because of high film pressures. Talked about this before, hef pef hef ref mitral, mitral valve disease, whether it's stenosis or regurgitation, where the left atrial pressure is already high to begin with. Um, if you have a persistent eustachian valve that directs IVC blood towards the atrial septum, you may block uh, actual saline contrast coming in from the SVC, from an from a arm vein or an anticubital peripheral venous contrast injection. Um, and then uh, a PFO uh, may be um, mistaken for a, uh, an AV malformation because of, uh, of um, um, not fulfilling the three-beat rule, and you get a positive saline contrast that occurs maybe six or seven cardiac cycles after RA pacification, but it occurs late because late during, um, uh, during the saline contrast study, the patient takes a big breath in, uh, for example, or coughs, translate increases right atrial pressure, uh, and then that uh, uh, leads to uh, uh, the shunting of bubbles from the right side to the left side, uh, well beyond um, that three-beat rule that we talked about earlier. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something that uh, that we do see. So here's a, a saline contrast study, go to pacification. And here you can see, I'm not sure if it shows up well on your screen, but there's a there, there are some bubbles that cross over. I would say it's in that one to two plus range. And let's check the time, one, two, three. So within three, maybe three to four cardiac cycles, we'll do it one more time. Two, three, yeah, about three. Um, and so it's about one to two plus. Um, and if you if you're observing, you actually see as the loop goes on, there's a few more bubbles that crosses over, and it's a bit more of an intermittent fashion, I would say, so leaning more towards a PFO. So here's the Valsalva patient screening, and then with the release phase here, you can see it goes up to pretty much four plus, I would say, uh, but dissipates uh, dissipates uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, positive at rest uh, within three cardiac cycles, maybe three to four, enhanced with Valsalva release. Uh, and this is more likely, much more, much more likely to be a PFO. So here's a, here's the, the T from the same patient. Um, this is the atrial septum here. You can see um, with this uh, two-beat cardiac cycle, you can see blue flow 
uh, a wave for the transducer. This is a left to right shunting across the, the PFO. Um, and here is the saline contrast. And you can see just increased inspiration, perhaps, or maybe pressing on the abdomen with release. Uh, to, uh, so pressing on the abdomen can uh, block venous return. Uh, and then you release it to increase venous return, transiently increase right atrial pressure uh, over left atrial pressure, and you get the little little puffs of of, of contrast um, uh, uh, going uh, across. Um, so here's another saline contrast study. So here it's a it's 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 probably one plus. A little bit intermittent, but quite late. Let's check that again, actually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven cardiac cycles. But not really continuous, so the lateness would suggest uh, uh, EVMAP, uh, a pulmonary development, uh, trans pulmonary shunting, um, but the, the relatively intermittent um, just really that that's that one puff late, um, so we cannot rule out PFO in this case. Balsalva. Strain. Release, and here you can see um, a nice example where uh, Balsalva enhancement really helps. Uh, you can see what with, you know, the timing is good, the release phase times with uh, a right atrial pacification early, very positive saline contrast study. So this is this is a PFO. This is a three plus if you're scoring if you're scoring in the back. And here's that this patient's T. Um, uh, so so here you can actually see by color Doppler transient intermittent right to left shunting. If you're observant you can see uh, that a little bit of right red flow here. Red we know is uh, is towards the transducer. You see blue flow fairly continuous throughout the cardiac cycle, but intermittent um, uh, left sorry right to left shunting. And this goes to the principle of the two phases of the cardiac cycle I talked about before, where right atrial pressure can translate increase above left atrial pressure. Um, this patient actually fell asleep during the study. It started to snore. <laughs> uh, snoring is sort of you know, pushing up against the closed glottis to some extent, it's like a weak valsalva, and you can see the, the enhanced um, uh, uh, right to left shunting. Those neat, neat things that you notice during echocardiography um, that, uh, that um, is, is kind of rewarding um, that you see. Okay, here's case three. These are just cases to, to finish up, and i um, happy to get some, uh, some input from anybody who wants to to um, either put it in the chat box, I'm not sure if uh, anybody can, if anybody wants to put it in the, the chat box here. Uh, so uh, if what they think is going on here. So let's look, look, look back at this here again. Let's start all over again here. One, two, three, four, five, so five cardiac cycles, maybe five to six cardiac cycles. Fairly contiguous, yep. So do you think this is a, a PFO or do you think this is a, um, a, a trans pulmonary shunting? What do folks think? We've got lots of time for these cases. I think I have about six cases. Okay, Dr. Shaw says trans pulmonary shunting, fairly good news, I would agree. Here's the Valsalva. Uh, really no change, I would say. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, timing is about the same. Hasn't really changed the timing. And the opacification is about the same. Every now and then we'll, we'll see what we think is transformation. I think that that's actually enhanced by the Valsalva. Um, makes us scratch our head a little bit. Uh, it may be in part related to uh, the increased cardiac output beams return in the release phase that might enhance transpulmonary shunting, perhaps. So here's this patient's T. 
And a lot of times these patients are a bit confusing and we don't know. And then, then Dr. Fawn and, and the HHG maths has to do a, the, a to be to be certain, uh, particularly if, let's say, they, um, they, the CT scan is negative for AV malformations. Uh, and we're not sure whether or not it's a, 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 um, a, a, a interatrial versus transformation shunting. So here we're interrogating at the uh, at the at the site of um, the fossil valus uh, where PFOs are, uh, and uh, you can actually see a, see a positive study. Um, it's a little bit faint. I'm not sure if it shows up well on your screen, but um, it's a little bit faint. But you can see there are some bubbles that cross over, cross over late, but you don't you don't really see it crossing over the atrial septum. Um, but it is positive. It's a positive study. Timing would suggest that um, that it's probably later than expected. You don't, actually don't see it uh, crossing through the through where the through the fossil valves where a PFO would be. Uh, and in these cases, we try to interrogate the pulmonary veins. Uh, so here we're trying to manipulate saline contrast injection. You can see right right heart pacification, and we're now trying to track. And this is the left upper pulmonary vein, and here you can clearly see. Uh, bubbles coming in through the left upper pulmonary vein, and sometimes we'll do multiple injections uh, to look at um, uh, to look at um, uh, whether we can see the saline contrast. The, the right upper, the, the upper pulmonary veins, as the fellows know, are much easier to detect uh, and to examine fluid than the than the uh, than the lower pulmonary veins. So the right upper and left upper pulmonary veins much easier to do. And sometimes we'll have to do dedicated saline contrast injections for each individual uh, pulmonary vein. So here's another uh, case four. A lot of people think about this case. Let's see that again. One, two, so very early, very early and a good three plus, three to four plus of pacification. And Jonah mentions it's pretty intermittent, I agree. It's pretty early. Um, it's not continuous, but it's a lot of shunting. It's it's pretty sizable. There's a little puff there, and then dissipates pretty fast. You don't see it much late, although it still kind of hands or hangs around a little bit in part because it was so so great early on. So you know it 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 does the the the, the timing does suggest a PFO. We we'll look at that again. Sometimes we'll try and see whether it's coming from the atrial septum. Difficult to know for sure here. You know, it could be coming from a from a right upper pulmonary vein. Um, sometimes these circumstances, when it's so early, so great, you you worry about a sinus venosus defect that you can't see. Um, and sometimes you can't really visualize well with uh, with trans thoracic echocardiography. Um, so here's this patient's T, and you can actually see just clearly at rest there's a a two D gap, um, and there's there's this obviously shunting. Uh, from uh, uh, left atrium to right atrium with collodopathy, that big prominent red flow. Um, and you could argue you don't need to get silly contrast. We, we did it anyways because, uh, you know, we just like proving a point. Uh, uh, but also getting getting fantastic pictures. You can see, you know, big time shunting through this this very, you know, we, I always joke around with the fellows that, you know, you don't really size PFOs, small PFOs, large PFOs. Um, um, but this is this I would say this is the prototypical large PFO. This is a this is you can drive a truck through this uh, through this paper frame of the valley. Okay, so here's another contrast study done for um, HHT, Dr. One of Dr. Paul's patients. So this is this is uh, okay. So this is not this is not definity. <laughs> if you're if you're thinking this is certainly almost looks like. Uh, Almost looks like uh, definitive contrast, but uh, but it's not. Um, so what do you see here? Anybody want anybody want to describe what they see? This is a uh, uh, yeah, This is a really this is a cool case. What do folks think? Any takers? I'll, I'll go to our most advanced echo trainee, Patrick. Are you on? Is Patrick on? Let's tell. Let's somewhere. Uh, let's try. Is he on? Chilling is he on? Howard. Uh, as well. On. Bob Howard. Hey, Bob. So I guess my comment would be, 
because PFOs are incredibly common, uh, whenever you have Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, there's a lot of static there for a second. Um, PFOs are common, AVMs are not, but when you have an AVM, there's still a reasonable chance that they also have a PFO. So you can have both. And um, so I, so one of the things I like to find that, you know, just looking in real time, you know, sometimes one frame has a story and it goes by so fast that it's hard to, it's hard to sort of see it. So I actually go frame by frame on all of these. And you can sometimes very clearly see some bubbles that come early and they clearly come across the septum. And then if you have an AVM, bubbles come late and you can see them coming out of the pulmonary veins. So I'm wondering on this one, it's not frame by frame, but if there's some early bubbles coming from the septum and then late bubbles coming from the pulmonary veins. So this patient has both. Yeah, no. So if you, this, uh, no, thanks, Bob. Um, and um, you can see Bob, Bob, Bob is, I think Bob is like me, actually. He really likes these answers. He has, obviously, Bob has more experience with these because um, he's, he's been practicing since the early days of, uh, of the HHT. Um, you know, we were doing RCC in contrast more than we were doing uh, Definity or or or, or for the enhancing agents contrast. So you can see early on, and I'm I'm going to try and scroll back here. Okay, so early you can see bubbles crossing, and you get the sense it's coming from the atrial septum, and then there's a second rush of bubbles coming in more from the left side of the atrial septum, and that is greater than the initial. And that tends to opacify completely the uh, the atrium and the ventricles early, and that's a puff. And then late, although the late's not that late when you think about it. The late, let's just say, if you time out the late, um, one more time, one. Oh, oh, hold on, I apologize. One, two. So two, three, four, five. Yeah, five to six cardiac cycles on the second one, um, and you know, uh, as Bob has said, this is a this is a patient with both an anti-atrial shunt and um, a transpulmonary shunt. So this this patient actually went on to have a CT scan, had a had an AVM in the I believe the left lower lobe that was quite large that underwent embolization, uh, and in this patient actually, this is from the same patient. This is the subcostal view, uh, and we had already detected the patient had a, a PFO. Um, by by traditional means, <laughs> by uh, by 2D uh, color Doppler, you can see the, the little red flash here, the atrial septum zoom view and the subcostal view, uh, and this is uh, left to right shunting, um, and of course we, we generally try and confirm it with pulse wave Doppler as well, showing the left to right shunting. So this is as, as Bob has said, um, and Bob nailed it, um, uh, the uh, a PFO with a pulmonary beam affirmation. We've certainly seen We've seen a few cases like this, and sometimes, um, sometimes if we don't see the PFO uh, on uh, transthoracic echo, uh, the, the HHT team asks us to do a, a T, um, and you know, we've seen it on T as well with both um, interatrial and transformation team. So we have about 12 minutes left. So here's my last case. Um, this is a, this more images on this case, a bit more challenging. Um, so um, and probably. Uh, actually, this is the only case I've seen like this. <laughs> uh, maybe others have. Um, so uh, there's an RV inflow view on the left uh, and um, a uh, apical four chamber view on the right. So um, what do we see here? Um, I'm not sure if anybody is uh, interested in, in, in sharing what they think they see or um, there's this unusual stuff uh, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's seen here. Um, so that's actually, you know, this patient was referred for, it was um, actually referred by Tony Graham, and I think the patient had an outside echo that uh, suggested uh, a membrane in the left atrium. So the question was whether or not this was um, a core triatriatum sinister. Um, and uh, so 
what do we see? Oh, Sean, uh, that, sorry, Sean, I didn't see that. So, uh, so yeah, Sean, Sean has has it correct in that that um, there's a linear structure um, that's in the atria um, that is um, you know makes you wonder about a core triad and sinister, and that's why the patient uh, has uh, was referred back for echocardiography. Um, um, any any other any other thoughts from the audience before we uh, move on? You know we're going to give some bubbles uh, a little bit later on, so um, and you know we'll do a tea later on as well. So <laughs> uh, seems to be the pattern. Any other comments before we move on? Pretty funky looking. If you've attended rounds rounds of you know one of my favorite topics, just funky flows. This is not funky flows. This is this is funky to be. So a zoomed up view, a pickle four chamber view. Color Doppler. So, you know, initially when we were doing the study, we thought, you know, we thought maybe this is the atrial septum, that's aneurysmal. Not sure what this structure is. And there's this flow coming in through here that's red being directed and you, you, you know, Pretty typical place for us to see the right upper pulmonary vein, and we're not sure if that's the right upper pulmonary vein or not. We try and Doppler it with PW. I'm not sure if it, this has been helpful. It doesn't doesn't? You know, I guess it could be pulmonary venous flow. I'm not sure. The velocities are fairly low, uh, fairly continuous, as we saw with color Doppler, um, but uh, not that not that helpful. So here's saline contrast. So what do we uh, what do we see here? So I don't I don't want to diag I don't necessarily want to diagnose this, but I kind of want to hear see what people think. Anybody? And I don't see Patrick. I'm there. I'm just under Ch uh, Chiming's chow account. It's almost like a negative contrast. You expect something to be there, but there's nothing there. Well, there's no bubbles on the left heart for sure. Um, but in right. terms of delineating oh. what those structures are, um, does it help you? So I, I'm just thinking that linear structure that we previously thought was the intratrial septum. It doesn't look like there are any bubbles shunting across from it, and there's no bubble in the left heart. So it makes me wonder if that's the actual, like, if that's a true intraatrial septum. Right. Yeah, and that's what we're we're wondering. So we're looking here and seeing is there any opacification here? Um, and it doesn't really look. This obviously it is. It, it kind of does this through play motion. That's but nothing significant. Um, so okay. So here's so we do Valsalva. It's positive. It's a one plus. Pretty early. Two to three cardiac cycles. Looks like a PFO, right? So the the question is: Is this? Uh, is this? Um, uh, is this? Uh, an atrial septal aneurysm with associated PFO. We know PFOs are associated with with atrial septal aneurysm. I see um, uh, one of the one of the attendees has has, has questioned the sinus venosus defect. Certainly, always a consideration. I would say that a sinus venosus defect would, would be more likely to to have a much greater degree of shunting, uh, especially with acetylene contrast, because uh, superior sinus venosus defects tend to be more common than inferior ones, uh, and you should see an early positive, usually four plus. So timing would fit uh, potentially, um, but the, the amount of shunting, let's say it happens to be a really super duper small uh, sinus venosus defect. So I guess it is possible. It is, it is within, the, within the differential diagnosis. Okay, so here's, here's the T. Uh, and actually that structure that we thought was uh, atrial septal aneurysm is actually this structure here. 
which is a which is a very prominent long um, uh, eustachian valve. Uh, and the structure that we thought that was a linear structure within the left atrium may be some sort of membrane, uh, an unusual uh, um, core triad transistor. It's actually the true atrial septum. And you know we. So actually, there's a there's a small aneurysm within the true atrial septum actually, and the patient actually does have a PFO. Um, you can see a bit of the the two D aspect of it here. Um, and you can see the blue flow here is actually cable flow from the IVC directed towards the atrial septum. So these are one of the this is one of the cases where with saline contrast, um, it's such a prominent long eustachian valve. It actually almost blocks acid saline um, uh, from the from the uh, arm veins to get to the atrial septum. There's a little bit that gets there. Obviously, it crosses with the valsalva, but at rest, it doesn't get there, um, and it creates that negative effect that we saw with the trans thoracic echo um, uh, uh, on um, uh, with the saline contrast. Um, so. Oh, that's it. Uh, let's do that again. Yeah, so this is uh, this is an unusual case of a, a prominent eustachian, very, very prominent long retained eustachian valve um, mimicking the atrial septum um, and uh, I guess causing this atrial septum to mimic some form of a membrane or core triad triatum sinister, uh, sinister. Okay, um, well, that's it. Um, I guess it is five minutes to the hour, so um, I'm more than happy to take any questions. I'm sure any of the attendings are more than happy to take any questions as well. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, some useful knowledge for you as you as you do more through the contrast studies in your labs. So, hard is it's Bob again. 